It's a great pleasure to be here. This is without question um, the most favorite part of my relatively new assignment as, as your CEO uh, because I get to share with you the tremendous accomplishments and successes of this wonderful organization that we're all a part of. In preparing this presentation, I was thinking about um, a conversation that I had with my family about uh, a year or two ago. It was over Thanksgiving holiday, and in my family, like many American families, we have a tradition where all the boys, with, uh, I have three brothers, all the boys come home with our extended families and spend Thanksgiving with our parents. Well, uh, what's come to pass is our children, um, as we've had kids, and um, we, we typically have an early dinner for the children, and then we put the kids to bed, and then uh, we eat our dinner after that and, and stay up late into the evening swapping stories. Well, this one Thanksgiving, um, it was late. We had cleaned the table, and uh, my father was talking to my older brother, John, who is the chairman and CEO of a high-tech firm that employs about 2,500 people uh, around the country. And John was talking about how, uh, despite the, the downturn in the market, because of their, the, the very specific product that they produced, that they had been uh, having a series of successful quarters, um, and, it was, and it was looking very good for the company. My younger brother, Emmett, who actually is John's marketing vice president, um, explained how all the technology um, that they were using to, to sort of stay ahead of their competition, um, they, they, they do security solutions. For example, they provide the on-field passes for the Washington Redskins. Um, uh, and then my brother Nick, who's an investment banker, uh, was talking about the volatility in the derivatives market uh, because he runs a large hedge fund. And so there was a pause in the conversation, and my father looked over at me, and he said, Chris, Trout Unlimited, exactly what is it you do? And I said, Dad, I have the best job in America. And here's why. TU is working to protect the last, best places we have to hunt and fish, restore habitat that has been degraded, and reconnect these two places by putting water back in stream removing small and large barriers for fish to move throughout the entire system. It's a holistic approach, but it's working to ensure that native fish will once again thrive within their historic ranges. For fighting. Whiskey for drinking, water for fighting. Take three seconds and look around, look where you're at. This is pretty good. It's the sort of place where we go to get our boots dirty and our souls clean. Certainly it makes no sense to take 250,000 acre feet a year out of this river and ship it to the front range of Colorado to grow bluegrass. may not be a wild place, but it's my place. If you're able to catch fish down here, then you're a pretty good fisherman. Why shouldn't we protect what we have? Once it's gone, it's gone. I want to tell you why, um, for me, every morning is like Christmas morning. Every one of those people that you saw in that video is either a TU employee or a volunteer for TU. 
And we could have told their stories a thousand more times or at least several hundred more times with all of you. Um, it's an extraordinary organization doing extraordinary things. And so uh, what I want to do is take you through some of our highlighted accomplishments for the year. All of you are familiar, as was described in the video, with the four basic goals of our strategic plan, protecting the highest quality habitats, restoring areas where we can see the highest return on the restoration investment, and then reconnecting those areas by working on in-stream flow and otherwise removing uh, passage barriers for fish. And of course, the social imperative of sustaining that good work over time by making sure that we're training that next generation of conservation stewards. This map is not all-inclusive, um, but I think it gives a representative sampling of some of the really good work that Trout Unlimited has been involved in over the past year in a variety of land protection efforts. I will tell you that I am going to focus largely in this presentation on the work of the national programs, but there is not a single um, program or project that I will describe in any of our, uh, any of our areas that is not, does not have direct involvement of the grassroots. So these are our shared successes across the organization. As John mentioned earlier, Larry Harris will follow me with more specific accomplishments at the grassroots, but these are absolutely shared accomplishments. I'll start off in Idaho, a good place to start. Idaho is blessed with some of the best fish and wildlife habitat uh, in the lower 48 states. Yeah, there, he, he there you go. A Homer in the audience there, Lauren Albright. Um, Several years ago, Trout Unlimited was intimately involved in coming up with a, 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 propo a regulation that protects about 9 million acres of these so-called roadless areas. You can see the crosshatch of blue, which represents native um, trout and salmon habitat in the state, and the areas in green, which are either roadless areas or wilderness areas, and it makes the very obvious point about why those places are so important for TU and for native fish. This year, we successfully defended that regulation against litigation and I'm confident the rule will prevail. Most importantly, the state of Idaho, which was perhaps most hostile to backcountry protection of all of the 50 states when the 2001 Roadless Area Conservation Rule was promulgated, is now advocating for this kind of protection for its backcountry areas. Another fairly difficult place to um, protect land is in northwestern Nevada. There, TU formed a collaborative effort with ranchers, county commissioners, and other conservation interests and came up with a proposal to protect about 24,000 acres of wilderness, some really important Lahontan and cutthroat trout habitat, as well as big game habitat, upland bird habitat, and so forth. What's really novel about this is that the Nevada General Assembly actually passed a resolution praising this wilderness bill as the right way to do wilderness. I think TU really prides itself on, on trying to work with a variety of interests to come up with common uh, or, uh, uh, compromise solutions uh, for development projects, but some places just shouldn't be developed. The, the headwaters of the East Walker River in California, the Bodie Hills is one of those places. Again, uh, the sort of TU model of working with a variety of local interests um, was brought to bear on this proposed gold mine. Three times the Mono County uh, Commission uh, tried to get a, a resolution passed to support development of this mine. Three times, Trout Unlimited's uh, chapters and councils and, uh, the, and Dave Lass and other staff helped to defeat that proposal. This is a place that shouldn't be mined, as this opinion editorial by Mike Kowalski, the CEO of Tiffany & Company, a company that is obviously reliant on precious minerals, um, points out. As many of you know, um, in 1977, the picture's on the right, the Teton River blew out, tragically, uh, the Teton Dam blew out, tragically killing about 14 people. Miraculously, the damage wasn't worse and the fatalities weren't worse. Um, we've built the Idaho Council and our local chapters in the area, along with the Idaho Water Project and the Sportsman Conservation Project, have done a great job of transforming this whole conversation into what's the most rational way to promote water conservation and smaller storage projects in the state to meet the water needs of uh, irrigators without compromising what has turned into a remarkable fishery. Perhaps one of the best examples of this concept of one TU that we talk about can be found uh, this year in, in uh, Utah. The Forest Service was proposing an oil and gas development on about 734,000 acres of publicly owned national forest land. The Utah Council, working with Corey Fisher and others, uh, proposed 
uh, a, an alternative approach that would essentially protect all the roadless areas, that would protect streamside areas that are so important for fish and wildlife, and would have monitoring in those places where they are doing oil and gas development, so that if sedimentation began to occur, those oil and gas companies would take corrective action. The agency almost entirely adopted our proposal. It was a major win for TU. In some places, we're working to try to balance interests. Off-road vehicle use has become rampant across the Western United States. We're working with a variety of coalitions. This has been a great effort between uh, the Five Rivers chapter, the Colorado Council, the Sportsman Conservation Project, and the Colorado uh, Water Project to recommend some wilderness, to recommend some in-stream flow, and to keep uh, two, two areas that are just absolutely important for Colorado River cutthroat trout intact. We're confident that we'll be able to secure, if not wilderness protection, some sort of federal, de federal designation that will keep these areas protected this year. The Tongass National Forest in Alaska is home to 25% of the world's remaining temperate rainforests. It's a fish factory, a salmon factory. The economic impact of salmon fishing in the Tongass is profound. Um, we're helping the Forest Service transition away from a history of roadless area entries and old growth logging. They're one of the last forests in the country that still target old growth trees. And instead, we're helping them to understand that there's a future for the agency and there's more economic opportunity for these local communities in targeting second growth forests and in promoting restoration. TU and our Alaska program just initiated a, a restoration project on Prince of Wales Island in a place called Fubar Creek, which the Forest Service now wants to use as a model for the rest, the rest of management of the Tongass National Forest. I didn't name the creek. In Maine, uh, when you look at our, our conservation success index and you look up in the uh, northeast corner of the country, you see a big blue blotch there, which uh, signals that Maine has the most intact brook trout habitat in the country. And Maine has been a real leader in identifying and protecting these areas. Jeff Reardon is working with the Maine Council to identify those ponds that are so important for these large brook trout and to make sure that those places are protected. And importantly, uh, we've developed a whole series of management guidelines for working with private land timber companies in a, it, so that they can produce timber in a way that isn't harmful for brook trout fisheries. And we're hoping to implement those practices this year. Importantly, unlike the West, in the East, all of this land is private land, and the work has to be done in a more collaborative manner. We don't have the big uh, federal authorities that we have uh, that apply to the, many of the public lands out West. I think everyone in this room should be familiar with the extraordinary work that Jeff Hastings um, and Duke Welter and the uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois councils um, have done in promoting restoration of the 28,000 or 26,000 acre, uh, or I'm sorry, 26,000 square mile driftless area. Lesser known, but of equal importance, is the work that they're doing with private landowners to secure easements that protect this land and keep it managed as a, a protected fishery in perpetuity. Here's an example of two easements that were secured along uh, Gilbert and Pine Creeks. Um, one of the longtime residents, um, the woman who, uh, Joanne Thorod of Menominee, after the work began, she stood by that riffle on the, on the left and said, and she listened to that stream gurgle by, and she said, I've lived here for 30 years, and the river has never quite sounded like this. Extraordinary work in the driftless. Moving back to the east, and the, the Chesapeake Bay is well known for its extraordinary striper fishing and bluefish and other saltwater species. It's a, a magnificent estuary. All of its headwaters are cold water fisheries. Those are all really important brook trout streams. And we're modeling some really innovative market-based conservation approaches in, in these headwater systems, coming up with a concept called brook trout credits, where we, we pay landowners to implement brook trout practices that we know will benefit that fishery and keep it intact. Another example of uh, working with private landowners and, and uh, land trusts to conserve private lands in the east is in North Carolina. This is an extraordinary example of the dedication of our members. There was, an, there was uh, some pub, uh, private land that had the opportunity to be developed in a way that would be very detrimental to this really magnificent little fishery. And in the span of two weeks, we sent a fundraising note out to all of our southeastern chapters, and we raised $30,000 to cover the transaction costs that allowed us to put this land into public ownership and to keep it protected. The, the, and the, the best news is that $30,000, when this deal goes through, will come back to Trout Unlimited and we'll be able to use it for other 
private land work. Another example of working to protect private lands in the east is our, our work with the Conservation Fund to protect rock, the Rocky Fork River in Tennessee. This is an area that has 15 miles of um, blue ribbon trout stream for brook trout. Again, if, if you look further south on that CSI map, there's one little speck of blue in the southern Appalachian region. It's here. It's this fishery right here. And we're, we're, we've completed four out of the five phases necessary to move this piece of property into Forest Service ownership where it, where it will be protected forever. The Pebble Mine should need no introduction to this crowd. Trout Unlimited has been a real thought leader in, in fighting this, this proposal. In March, based on our advocacy and the advocacy of the people that we're working with up in Alaska, we were able to convince the EPA to initiate a process where they're looking at public sentiment and science. And they're going to have those two factors to drive their decision about whether or not to exercise their authority under the Clean Water Act to pull the permit that will forever keep this place protected from this mine. We've had an extraordinary experience here working with commercial fishermen, subsistence users, recreational interests, um, the outdoor sporting industry, a whole array of people. And notably, Tiffany and company has also been a strong supporter here. Sort of the, the other 1,100 pound gorilla in the room, uh, but at this time on the eastern side of the country is uh, the Marcella Shale. The Marcella Shale is an extraordinary energy formation found 8,000 feet down below the uh, Earth's surface. Historically, it was deemed um, economically unviable to, to be able to develop it. It's now being developed in Pennsylvania aggressively, and uh, TU is working to make sure that this development doesn't ruin some fairly extraordinary natural resources in that state. We've created um, a coalition of national and regional groups called the Sportsmen for, the Sportsmen for Mar Marcellus Conservation. Over 60,000 sportsmen from that area have signed up to, help, to be a part of the solution for protecting their uh, fish and wildlife resources. The state of West Virginia, TU in West Virginia has done a great job at advocating at the state level for regulations that would force these companies to um, manage setbacks and to make sure that water quality is maintained. And TU has been a real leader at the council level and through the good work of Katie Dunlap in, making, in, in maintaining a moratorium on, oil and, on, on uh, Marcellus development in the state of New York. Places like the Pebble Mine and and Pennsylvania have such, I'm sorry, places like Alaska and Pennsylvania have such rich traditions of hunting and angling. And I think that's what sets groups like Trout Unlimited apart from your sort of garden variety environmental groups. These are real places that our people really care about. They know these areas, they have fished and hunted them their entire lives, and they're really, really important to keep protected. We have an abundance of water resources in this state, but if you take two to eight million gallons of water times 50 to 80,000 wells, how will that ultimately impact our water resources? We don't know because neither the state agencies regulating the industry or the industry have looked at that. The uh, council's position is that we understand Marcellus Shale can be an important economic activity in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania needs the jobs, but we also need the ensure that the industry and the regulatory agencies get it right and we're not losing important cold water fisheries. While Trout Unlimited supports balanced energy development, we do feel that there are certain areas that should be off limits to drilling. Probably the only state in the Union where on the first day of deer season all the schools have off. It's a holiday. Uh, so, you know, it's been a tradition that we've cherished for years and we're now concerned are we all going to be able to share the same piece of real estate? It's going to have an effect. I spend a lot of time in Mother Nature. I'm not the only one. People in Pennsylvania, this is our heritage. This is what we enjoy doing. This is what we don't want to see go away. Nobody wants to see something like this go away. What we have right now is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to ensure that we don't go and screw this up so that in 15 years or 20 years or 50 years, people are looking at us saying, "Why? how did you let that happen? The second um, 
because we realize that it's not enough to simply keep these protected areas managed as museum pieces, because we, we know uh, based on all the modeling and all the predictions and every indication that we're seeing on the news today, there will be increased floods and increased fire and increased drought in the coming years. It's not enough just to keep those headwater systems protected. It's vital that we actually reconnect them down to integrated, connected, restored watersheds. So I want to take you through some of the, uh, some of the accomplishments that our, our reconnect program has had around the country. Again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but I think it's a, it's a representative sample of some of the work that we've done around the country over the past year. And I'll take you through a few specific examples, starting with the really devastating floods in the Northeast and in New England. I'm sure all of you have heard about this. These are some of these river systems in Vermont um, and in uh, parts of New York experienced flooding levels that exceeded anything on record, anything ever historically recorded before. Um, I got a call from Chris Moore the day after Hurricane Irene hit Vermont. Chris Moore is the council chair from uh, the state of Vermont. And he said, you know, we really ought to get on top of this. And so I spoke with every single council chair in that region, and we agreed to send a message out to all of our TU members, volunteering TU staff and the help of TU chapters and councils to help these communities rebuild, to do the inventory work that needs to be done to get emergency funding to help put those places back together, and then importantly, to establish the goodwill and the credibility in those local communities so when the infrastructure uh, rebuilding does occur, they do it in a way that is not only safe for the communities, but it helps to maintain productive fisheries. This is an example of what we were worried about. This is the East Middlebury River. This is a river that I know very, very well. I spent many afternoons when I should have been in class fishing this river and have caught 23, 24 inch brown trout out of this. This is a gem that I've just revealed to you, um, which all of you should go spend tourist dollars in Vermont on. This is immediately, uh, this is a shot of a dozer in stream uh, doing some improvement work after the flooding. Two days after the flood, a friend of mine in Vermont emailed me and told me he had caught a 24-inch brown trout two days after the flood. That's how quickly the water went down. The town of Middlebury decided to go in there and use this opportunity to channelize the river, to pull out all the habitat, um, all the big boulders, all the rock, all the cover habitat. And this picture down here is immediately, it's actually, this, these, are, these are reversed, that's immediately downstream. The person who took this photograph, his rear end, is sitting on that backhoe. And that's what that habitat used to look like. We sent Jim McCartney and Colin Lawson up to Middlebury, good to our word that we were going to try to help these communities out. Uh, the commissioner of Vermont Fish and Game had called and asked for help. And they went up and testified. And the town of Middlebury, we believe, is going to try to put this back together. And we're going to help them do it. And this is the note that the commissioner of Vermont Fish and Game sent to Jim uh, McCartney and Colin Lawson, two TU staff, who went up there to help out. He said, um, you both made a strong impression that TU is committed to assisting in the restoration of the Middlebury River. Importantly, you represented TU in ways that transcend your expertise in fluvial geomorphology and hydrology. You were knowledgeable, objective, and passionate, while also striking the perfect tone in your messaging, delivery, and interpersonal skills. I am impressed, and TU should be proud. High praise for TU staff. One of the great challenges that we face in the Western United States are situations that look just like this. In the late summer and the early fall, many Western rivers run dry because of irrigation pumping for farming. The Western Water Project has been a real thought leader for about eight years now in helping to change that dynamic. We're going to review some of their successes here shortly. Few are more profound than the one on Monastish Creek in Washington State this year. The Washington Water Project was able to work a, a, an in-stream flow agreement out with a private landowner that put 11 CFS back in this river, rewatering 30 miles of critical salmon and steelhead habitat in the Yakima Basin. A truly extraordinary accomplishment. The Western Water Project, or the Montana Water Project, rather, um, several years ago had a, a, a major success in, um, uh, in, in uh, the uh, Montana Supreme Court when the Supreme Court agreed with TU that there, in fact, is a direct relationship between surface flows and subsurface flows. A fairly intuitive proposition for us. Uh, Montana water law had not historically recognized that. 
The problem was that all of these little subdivisions are able to get uh, developed through what they, because they're what they call exempt wells. They don't draw enough water to be regulated, to have their stream flow regulated. TU worked with the senior water right holders, irrigators, ranchers, long time ranchers who had been in this valley for many years and brought a case to the Montana uh, Supreme Court basically saying that this practice has to stop and these people need to be brought under regulation so we don't ruin the surface flows with this kind of harem scarum development. And the Supreme Court agreed with us. And right now, we're developing regulations that should require this practice of developing unregulated wells to end in Montana. One of the uh, great success stories of TU is our work on the Big, big Lost River in Idaho. Uh, this, is, this is the home, these are the stomping grounds of, of TU legends like Ted Trueblood. To date, TU has provided passage around every major obstacle in this river system, reopening 175 river miles to fish that was previously inaccessible. Another great example of the work that we do to recover and reopen habitat, to reconnect high quality habitat to protected areas is here on Spread Creek. This is a project that the Wyoming Water Project initiated a year and a half ago. They completed it this spring. They took the dam out, they went back and inventoried it, and fish were migrating up into an area that they hadn't been able to get to for 70 years, accessing 55 miles of habitat in roadless areas and national park that was previously inaccessible to native cutthroat. One of the um, somber notes of the, of the uh, day here is that this is the uh, uh, one person is not with us who is just a real hero who I would, I'm going to celebrate now and I wish he were here that so I could do it in person. Stan Griffin, a well-known and beloved TU volunteer, passed away this year in his 90s. Through the 80s and the 90s, Stan personally, on his own, never receiving a dime from TU, uh, filed appeals on 300 illegal water diversions in wine country. That, for, that action forced the state uh, legislature to pass a law known as AB 2121, which required, it basically gave uh, the wine growing community the option of going through a regulatory process with the state or a collaborative process with Trout Unlimited to come up with a way uh, to make sure that we can keep, uh, keep rivers wet for fish and also irrigate crops in wine country. To date, we're working in nine different watersheds in five counties to do exactly that. Here's an example of a 50,000 gallon uh, dry season off storage uh, water tank. We fill these things up when it's wet and the water's not as needed, and then when, it, when it's dry and the farmers need it, they can apply it to their crops. Again, working in collaboration with landowners, we're finding that uh, we're able to get a lot more done working with them than fighting with them. Several years ago, Tim Hawks and the Utah Water Project scored a seminal victory in getting in-stream flow legislation passed in Utah. In-stream flow legislation passed in Utah. This legislation allows private, leasehold, private landowners to lease their water to conservation interests to benefit cold water, imperiled cold water species. This year, for the first time, we were able to put that authority to use. Tim developed the relationships with a series of landowners that resulted in us putting water back in 15 miles of river that had previously run dry. We expect that trend to continue in the future. The Upper Colorado uh, Basin, as many of you know, about 60% of that water, which is so important for native trout, is diverted to the Front Range. There's a proposal on the table right now to develop, an to take an additional 25% and bring it over to the Front Range. Uh, the Colorado Water Project has been instrumental in working with uh, a variety of chapters in Colorado and the State Council, which has been wonderful in helping people to understand what an economically unwise idea this is and how ecologically damaging it would be to these very sensitive fisheries. And importantly, we've developed, along with a coalition of other uh, partner organizations, alternatives for, for providing water to the Front Range that doesn't involve building this boondoggle. Moving over to New England, uh, a project that we started about 18 months ago, Colin Lawson runs it, the person who I mentioned, mentioned earlier. Um, We've identified uh, in uh, three different states a series of different actions that we can take in terms of removing culverts. We've got nine on the books for this year that will reopen 60 miles of habitat that are presently inaccessible to fish. 
This has been a real partnership with the councils and the chapters in this region who have been simply outstanding to work with. We think this is the, there is no end to the amount of good that we can do by fixing and repairing obsolete or unneeded culverts and dams. I mentioned earlier in New York State the fact that we were able to work to maintain that moratorium on the development of Marcellus while they figure out how to do it in, a more, in an environmentally responsible way. We were also successful this year in getting the state legislature to pass a law that requires that anyone who wants to with, withdraw more than 100,000 gallons of water a day has to file a permit within an, the appropriate environmental agency. They also, this law also requires the development of regulations that will be, uh, which are designed to ensure aquatic life in rivers and maintain in-stream flows. Uh, just a, a wonderful project on the Muscanet Kong River that the New Jersey Council started and Brian Cowden, a former volunteer, now leads. Um, it, it started about two or three years ago. They've had remarkable success. In this past year alone, they've removed two dams for this wonderful fishery, which is, it starts off in Lake Hapatkong. So this, is, this turns the whole TU model upside down. The headwaters are dammed, but the river recharges through these spring-fed um, systems. And downstream, it's an absolutely stunning fishery. And we're removing the obstacles that uh, are keeping fish from flourishing in this area. And it's a, a wonderful example of the kind of partnerships that we can develop by working with private landowners and state and federal agencies. It's easy to sit here and sort of, you know, recite all of these programs, and it's easy to sort of fall into this sort of false sense of, well, this seems like it must be fairly easy. Each of these projects take years to develop. We have to go and develop partnerships on the public lands with the federal agencies and the state regulatory agencies. On these private lands, many of these landowners don't have any interest in talking to an environmental group. And so it takes a long time to develop their trust and earn their goodwill, and we do a remarkable job at it. You've probably never heard of Wasson Creek. It's just a small little stream that runs through our ranch. It's just a small tributary to a bigger river system, but those streams are so critical that it's just a, it's like a lifeblood to the community. Its value is that these main stem rivers that have native fish in them depend upon these little tributaries like Wasson Creek to be the nurseries that actually populate the larger streams. It used to be a real bog where cattle would cross it. Um, it was just a mud hole. And just within a few years, the stream narrowed and deepened. What we're starting to see up and down the riparian area since the cattle access has been limited. When we monitored temperatures in Wasson Creek in 2004, at the mouth of the creek, we measured temperatures as high as 80 degrees. The first year after the restoration was completed at the mouth, in the hottest summer on record, 2007, we measured a temperature of 66 degrees. That's 14 degrees difference, and that 14 degrees is the difference between life and death for cutthroat trout. We're on a tributary to Bear Lake called Fish Haven Creek, and this is a spawning tributary for some of the migratory Bonneville cutthroat trout that come up out of Bear Lake to spawn. We've done a lot of reconnection and restoration efforts on this stream to allow them to come up and spawn naturally uh, in some of the historic spawning grounds. In late 2009, we pulled out a long, about 300 foot long box culvert. This spring in 2010 is the first time in 60 years, thereabouts that fish have been able to get up into this system and spawn naturally. When I was around 10 years old, my dad was a biology teacher, and he, I turned, he brought me up and taught me about Bear Lake. So working on this project is really the realization of a dream for me. And this spring, with that barrier out, and, and we're working with monitoring these fish coming up and seeing them swim right through what before had stopped them, and seeing them spawn here in, these, in the clean gravel for the first time in 60 years has been special. So there's, there's two things about that video that are striking to me. The first is that in the span of one year, we recovered 14 degrees in temperature, which as Stan pointed out is the, the difference between life and death for these fish. These are remarkably resilient systems, and if you give them the opportunity to recover, they will in fact recover. The second thing that's remarkable is, um, uh, oh geez, she's going to kill me, I'm drawing a blank on his name, Kirk, Kirk Dolly. Kirk Dolly was not working in the progressive confines of Vermont right there. Kirk was working in Rich County, Utah. Utah, being the reddest state in the Union, 
and Rich County being the reddest county in Utah, that we were able to develop the trust and earn the, uh, the, the friendship of those landowners to go out there and have adfluvial populations of Bonneville cutthroat for the first time in 60 years migrating from Bear Lake to spawn in tributaries is really remarkable. We've talked a little bit about uh, restoration work already. Reconnect, of course, is a function of restoration. But this is really the bread and butter of this organization. For 50 years, Trout Unlimited chapters have been doing stream work in local communities across this country. And I want to share with you just a few of the broader scale programs uh, and watershed restorations that we've been involved in, again, around the country. I'm not going to cover all these. Don't worry. Um, but it, I think it is a fair sampling, although not exhaustive, of the work that we're engaged in. One of our newer projects is on the north coast uh, of, of Oregon. We work with a partner who we've worked with very well in California, the Campbell Timber Company. Alan Moore established this relationship. And um, we've been able to, in the span of a year, open up about 14 miles of spawning habitat in this off-channel habitat, which is so important for smolts, salmon smolts, um, uh, in, in this project. And we expect that this is going to go great guns, much like our North Coast Coho project has over the past 10 years. On the North Coast, this is just a typical representation of the kind of work that we've been engaged in for, for 10 years through the relationships we've developed with the Mendocino Redwood Company and the Humboldt Tim Timber Company. That culvert on the left was removed. We, we uh, re-engineered the uh, river channel to back to its natural contours and then put that bridge over it. In so doing, we removed 1,000 cubic yards of sediment that would have found their way into that stream. I think many of you have probably gone on the tour yesterday that Derek led. I was told it was simply outstanding. I regret I couldn't attend. Um, to me, what's most remarkable about the work that he's been able to establish in a really short period of time is, number one, the partnerships that he's developed with the local community and the local conservation interests here that were already engaged in working on this river system. And two, in the span of a year, Derek's had 275 kids out on this river, planting willows, otherwise engaged in restoration. And every one of those kids is now going to be an advocate for conservation and, and hopefully a TU member. Um, TU, for the past five or six years, has been heavily involved in abandoned mine cleanup. Rob Roberts has been leading a, a really remarkable effort in Montana. Everyone should be aware, if you're not, that the Montana Council was intimately involved in the removal of the Milltown da Dam, a, a historic enterprise several years ago. Well, the, um, the headwater, one of the tributary streams of the Clark Fork is, um, is a system called the Nine Mile System. And Rob's been working up there with a couple other folks to, and a tremendous amount of volunteers from TU to basically do projects like the one you see here. What, what's, what's happened here is 60,000 uh, cubic yards of toxic sediment that was leaching things like arsenic and lead and that whole, you know, toxic brew of stuff that abandoned mines leach. They removed it, they put it into a repository, they capped it, and then they revegetated it. There's another, there's not a, I don't have a picture of this, but another remarkable story of recovery um, is in a place called Maddie V Creek. They were able to remove about 300, I think it was 300 yards or so, of uh, mine tailings that were basically blocking passage for upstream migrating fish. They built a new channel, they recontoured the old channel, they removed all those tailings, and they went back up in the spring to inventory and fish had already occupied that new habitat. First time in 70 years. Um, another example of our work to clean up abandoned mines, um, uh, we have had such success with this uh, system that this is the Upper Boise watershed that was basically turned upside down by placer mining at the turn of the century. To date, this project has had over 20 1,700, correct me, 1,700 children participating in river plant, uh, you know, uh, uh, willow plantings and stream cleanups in the area. The Ted Trueblood chapter and other TU chapters and the state council have been real leaders there as well. This may be my favorite picture in this entire presentation. There is no single better demonstration, graphic demonstration, of the work that we do to recover streams than this here. This is a project that Matt Woodard led in, in uh, conjunction with uh, the Forest Service, who was really a, a thought leader on this one. Uh, uh, the fellow's name was, is Louis Wasniewski. I'll, I'll mention it because he's a good friend of mine, and he's a nephew of one of our trustees. He's the hydrologist on the forest. 
what happened here um, on the before shot, that's just, it's ha this happens all around the country. Someone took a bulldozer years and years ago and channeled out the river, took away all its natural bends, as you, you can see them up in the, in the foreground there. And in the after shot, Matt and the Forest Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and a variety of other partners went back in. They put the natural sinuosity back in the stream. This is well over a mile of restoration and fish are occupying it today. I mentioned the driftless area earlier. The extraordinary success of that project continues to amaze. This was a project that was started by the grassroots. It grew up and became a Home Rivers initiative. Um, this year, they spent $3 million on restoration projects in this area, and they recovered well over 16 miles of habitat, not just for fish, but what they're doing here that's so cool is they're creating snake and turtle hibernacula. They're, they're, they're protecting a whole variety of species that, are species that are benefiting from our restoration work. Our Arizona and New Mexico councils have been extraordinary thought leaders in promoting uh, the recovery of some of our most imper imperiled uh, southern trout populations of, of Gila, uh, Rio Grande, um, and Apache trout, sorry about that. Um, uh, they've been working in close collaboration with the State Department of Fish and Game and the Forest Service, willing partners. These guys are great. I visited their council meeting this past year and learned that there, had, there has been this extraordinary infestation of exotic crawfish um, in some of these systems. And what they're proposing to do is actually use native fish reintroduction, hopefully larger fish, to predate on these crawfish and, and, and use that as a way of simultaneously expanding the native fish while getting rid of the exotics. Yellowstone Lake is um, a classic example of, uh, of loss with a tremendous hope for recovery. In the 80s, Yellowstone Lake had a vibrant, healthy Yellowstone cutthroat trout population. In the span of about 20 or 30 years, we're now down to about 2 to 5 percent of those fish because of the introduction, the either intentional or, illegal or, or unintentional introduction of lake trout. Well, the Montana Council, Bruce Farling, Jack Williams, our senior scientist, Dave Sweet from our Wyoming uh, Council, and a variety of those chapters have been working with the park on a really innovative project. What they're doing is they've gone out and, and tagged a bunch of these lake trout. And then they put sensors up around the lake, so they're going to be able to find out where these fish go. They're calling them the Judas fish, where these fish go. And then they're going to go in there with nets and whack them when they go into spawn. It's a great, great story, and this is a battle that we can win. This is an aquatic invasive, aquatic invasive species issue that we can win, and it's certainly deserving of all of our support. The Upper Connecticut River, we've had tremendous success working with our, our local chapters and councils there. Uh, we've, this year alone, we raised over a half a million dollars to initiate uh, 10 out of a, a, a likely needed 50 culvert replacement projects that will open up dozens and dozens of miles of habitat that is now inaccessible. One of our newer, um, our newer project, Home Rivers initiatives, um, is in the state of Michigan. Thank goodness we finally got a Home Rivers initiative in our birth state. It took a long time, but Nicole DeMole is doing great work working with our, our council and chapters there uh, to, to identify stream crossings, to identify culverts that are in need of repair, and we're expecting great things from this project in the future. Uh, the Potomac Rivers Headwater Project is, is a really neat um, project. It's the, the, this system is basically, the headwaters are in the Monongahela National Forest. Their habitat's relatively intact. It's high quality brook trout habitat. The water's clean and cold. It comes downstream, it hits the valley bottom, and then it runs into the cows. And you can see what happens. All the complexities lost, there's no riparian uh, anything growing there uh, over three or four inches because the cows graze it out. Well, Gary Birdie and his team, and, and with some great, great help from volunteers, this year alone, constructed 30 miles of fence. Think about that, 30 miles of fence. And these systems are recovering. And they're recovering and we're extending that cold water influence further downstream so brook trout can continue to move and migrate. One of the other problems we have uh, in Appalachia is this historic legacy of, of coal mining. This is the coal that helped this country to win World War II. It has left a profound legacy of pollution as well and human health issues. 
Amy Wolf and her team in uh, Pennsylvania have been doing great work taking what started out as a small watershed restoration on a place called Kettle Creek, which is about one-tenth of the drainage of the west branch of the Susquehanna, and taking the lessons and the innovations that they learned there and applying it to the entire west branch, which drains 20% of the state of Pennsylvania. They're now taking the lessons that they've learned there and the successes that they're having there and spreading it out into different parts of Appalachia, which are also suffering from abandoned mine issues. Very similar project to, um, uh, to the Headwaters of the Potomac project. The, the Headwaters of the Shenandoah are also found often in public lands, protected public lands, either the park or uh, forest service land. Unfortunately, they come downstream and then they run into these ag lands, which are his, you know, often look like this. This project, what they did is the, in the upper, the upper photo is the before shot, the lower photo is the after. You can see they, uh, they helped to restore the natural sinuosity of that channel. They did a tremendous amount of plantings. The Massanutten chapter has been extraordinarily helpful in getting this project up and running. Our work in West Virginia and Virginia have uh, developed an extraordinary relationship with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we think that we're going to be able to expand this greatly throughout the Southern Appalachian region. Kerber Creek. This is um, uh, perhaps one of our, our most recognized and uh, awarded programs. This year alone, this project received five awards from the Forest Service, from the Bureau of Land Management, from the State of Colorado, from the American Fisheries Society, I'd make something up, but I'd get called on it. And from someone else who we really care about. <laughs> and, and you can see why. These are before and after shots. Elizabeth Russell and, her, and, a, and a whole array of partners were able to take over a mile and a half of stream. They removed, um, I can't remember how much, but it was a significant amount of toxic tailings, put it in a repository, and then recovered the landscape so it looks like the photos on the right. This is really a great example that even hairy issues like abandoned mines are not unresolvable. It just takes the willingness to work with a whole diversity of interests and the funds to get the work done. We know how to do this kind of work. We're here only as stewards of the land for a little while. The land is here always. And so we're just caretakers during our lifetime. I'm really impressed with Trout and Limited on this project. And, and I think a lot of it is the, 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 the person that I've had to work with. Trout Unlimited's goal across these arid western states is to find partnerships with ranchers to improve the health of ranching operations while we're improving the health of fisheries. Not giving up anything. They're not telling me how to irrigate or how much water to use or anything else. The only thing we're doing is saving these fish from going down the ditch. And, and it's a win-win situation for, you know, the public, uh, for myself. And, and, of course, the main critter that's been helped here is the vaudeville cutthroat. Have you guys seen the trend since the Marmot Dam has come out, one way or another, with the wild and hatchery fish or, or numbers of fish caught or just differences in general in the I mean, river? A lot of people were worried about the sediment, you yeah. know, behind the dam because it was just a diversion dam and there was a lot of sediment built up behind. They did a great job of clearing it all out, and then they just let that earthen dam go, and it flushed the river out. This river flushes this stuff for a long time, so it's yep. still doing it. My cool. first swung fly steelhead right there, man. <laughs> Sandy look, River. Look, hooked perfectly right in the corner of the mouth. You called the shot, right? <laughs> oh man, stopped at this little bucket right yeah. here. Unbelievable. Finally, I'm nearing the end. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, our efforts to build conservation capacity within the organization. You know, when, when we look at um, this concept of training the next generation of conservation stewards, the chapters and the councils have been light years ahead of the national organization for a long time. Uh, the the uh, camps, the youth conservation camps that, that you all have put on have been extraordinarily successful. This year alone, we have a record 22 state councils and chapters hosting youth camps. And if, if that's right, here, here, let's give a round of applause for those folks. I've, a, I've attended a number of these things, but I've never had to set one up, and I cannot imagine how much work goes into it. I had the uh, pleasure of spending last weekend with my son's 
four of his friends and my younger son. So I had six, six kids under eight alone in West Virginia. And that was just a small taste for me of what it must be like to set up one of these youth camps. You know, I, I remember I visited last year the New Jersey, the first New Jersey youth conservation camp. <laughs> I think they had 65 children. It was insane, but they did it. They did it and they did a great job at it. What we're trying to do now at the national level is really create almost a whole life cycle, sort of a life cycle process for getting kids into the organization and keeping them involved in conservation. It starts with Trout in the Classroom, a truly remarkable program that we've had great success with. Last year alone, we estimate that we influenced over 60,000 children through Trout in the Classroom. And those numbers are growing every year. Our staff does great work on Trout in the Classroom. And then they evolve over to First Cast when they're a little older. Um, perhaps they attend a conservation camp when they're in high school. The problem historically is, is that we, then we lose them. Then they either go to college or they begin working and we lose them for a while and maybe they'll remember to come back to the organization or maybe they won't. Well, we've done a really good job in developing um, a new concept called the Five Rivers Chapter Concept or the Five Rivers Concept. And the idea is that we can engage with colleges and universities to get kids into fly, who are into fly fishing into these clubs and they'll partner up with a local TU chapter and be a ready source of of, of, of restoration labor um, and of, of knowledge to help pass on conservation so that these kids when they're 22, 23 years old, they know that their first stop ought to be to go to tu.org and become a TU member. <laughs> Uh, I enjoy the thrill of it, just uh, going out there and sitting in a river and uh, having the river flow on you while you fish. And it's going to take a lot of skill and the fish trout is beautiful, you know, um, just love everything about it. As a club we work with Trout Unlimited, fishing and cleanups and just keep the environment for the trout uh, healthier uh, so they'll live longer and have to be more fish in every stream. It's more about meeting people and introducing people into the sport, um, you know, because it, I think it's just, a, it's just a great way to be in the outdoors. Anybody is welcome to join the club. Um, I think we have a lot of beginners this year. Um, it would be really easy to join the club because we have a lot of people that would help out that have been fishing for many, many years. And nobody is afraid, you know, you're not going to be discriminated against if you've not ever fished before. So um, we're, we're drawing to the, to the end now. Um, I just want to make an observation. You know, all of this work that we've seen so far, this idea of uh, protecting, you know, the places that look like America used to look like, the notion that we can, you know, take on hairy concepts like taking out dams and recovering 55 miles of habitat for fish that haven't had access to it, you know, in generations. This idea that we can literally, you know, work with communities of place and communities of interest to repair the lands and waters that sustain us. Th that stuff is a, it's really compelling and we do a really good job of raising funds for it and getting that work done. And, and you all have been a source of both the funding and the labor. The stuff on this screen right here, this is the hard stuff to raise money for and this is what your membership dollars contribute to every year. TU has one of the best presences in Washington DC. We are absolutely respected by our partners in the state and, feder and the federal agencies because of the ability of people like Steve Moyer and Keith Curley to bring dozens of you back to, to lobby on really important issues before Congress. You can put a paid hack like me in front of a member of Congress and their eyes will glaze over after the handshake. You put a, a constituent in front of them who's saying, hey man, you really need to take notice. I want those Idaho roadless areas protected or it's not acceptable to me that you're cutting conservation funding for the farm bill and they will, they will listen. They will, they will sit up and take notice. That's what your membership dollars contribute to. They contribute to the kind of science that's not only shaping the priorities of our organization, it's shaping the priorities of other state and federal agencies, as I'll describe in a minute. And it allows us to do things like expand our volunteer services, to start new programs to help veterans and women who are recovering from cancer to, uh, to heal, 
and to do a whole array of other uh, activities associated with marketing and communicating the organization. You see this graph here shows a 10% membership increase over the past two years, and that's very good news. But the fact is, when you look at our market penetration versus other colleague organizations like Ducks Unlimited or the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, we aren't anywhere near what they are in terms of our ability to engage our constituency. I think it's absolutely imperative that we make this a major priority for the organization. Growing the membership significantly increases our heft in state legislatures and in Congress. It, it allows more resources to be delivered on the ground. It's more volunteer labor. In, being able to expand, explain rather the value proposition of TU to anyone who fly fishes is a major priority of our marketing initiative. I'm not going to spend much time on this because Hillary is going to take you through the, the financials, which, and she has um, gra the grassroots covered in hers. Um, but it's been a remarkable year, not just for the, the resources that you've raised, but also you've really put, many of the councils have really kind of put their head down and done some slog work, which is really important for the organization in terms of modernizing our bylaws and developing these strategic plans that tear off our Protect, Reconnect, Restore, Sustain strategic plan. Ultimately, once we get all the state councils to do that, and each of the chapters in turn do it, there should be no distinction between the agenda of Trout Unlimited at the national level and TU at the chapter level. They should be the same. I think that um, just in, in, the, in the short time that I've been here, the 10 years that I've been at TU, the uh, services that we're provi providing to membership, I think, have expanded tremendously. Lines to Leaders is an extraordinarily valuable resource. The Tackle Box, if you haven't accessed it, is chock full of information that's really important. Um, we do monthly trainings. Every month we do trainings, on conservation trainings, on a whole array of topics. And those are all recorded and downloadable for anyone who wants to access them. Our regional meetings have been, I think, much improved. They're, they're, they're run much more tightly. Here you see Mick McCorkle up there carrying on. But it's, it's I think, a testament to the, uh, the organization that we take seriously these kinds of services. I already talked at fair length about um, our youth programs. I'll simply say that we've been extraordinarily lucky to have the leadership of Franklin Tate running these programs. He's been with us for about a year. And, and trustees like Ido Kiernan and Mike Dombeck, who have reformulated our, our youth education program into something that we're now calling Headwaters and are going to take us into brand new heights with youth education. I mentioned this already. Uh, this is a program we started last year. Alan's done tremendous work in the span of one year already. I mean, this is, this is the work that our councils and chapters are doing to work with vets who have given so much for this country. Our ability to give something back to these people and to help them to heal through access to fly fishing and conservation is something we all ought to make a priority. I mentioned, um, I mentioned the, the good work of our legislative staff. Uh, this is, these are uh, a, a bunch of people that we brought back to testify on Capitol Hill uh, about uh, the energy bill. Um, and and you know, Steve Moyer and, and Keith Curley and, and others inside of TU put these fly-ins, we call them, together on a routine basis. And if any of you are interested in coming back and helping out, please let us know because we need your help. I, I think one of the most uh, transformational aspects of this organization is what uh, Jack Williams and the science team have been able to accomplish. Um, this past, I guess it was June's edition of Fisheries, 80% of the entire magazine was Trout Unlimited. It's this concept of coming up with these native fish uh, protected areas. Uh, I'm going to forget the name now, but basically creating fish refuges that correlate to wildlife refu refuges, which are essentially uh, uh, geared toward terrestrial species. Um, they published a, a, a really seminal paper in the uh, National Academy of Science, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, that showed we have the potential to lose 50% of our trout populations in the western United States because of climate change if we don't take action to protect and reconnect and restore these landscapes, if we don't take that kind of corrective action that is in fact the TU agenda. We set up the Conservation Success Index so that it would better inform our advocacy and our restoration work. It turns out it's now setting the agenda for state and federal agencies across the country, and that should only accelerate over time. I mentioned um, our, our objective to, to really amp up our marketing and communications effort. We've brought in Dietmar Grimm, who's here today. Um, 
uh, to lead this effort for us. Please spend time with him. Educate the boy while he's still new. Um, but he's done extraordinary work in a relatively short period of time in terms of bringing together the great expertise we already had in marketing and communications within the organization, but that was diffuse and sort of spread out. And he's done a tremendous job of rationalizing it and developing a marketing plan for the organization that I think will lead to that growth I described earlier. And one of the really innovative and cool things that we're doing is over time, we're going to turn tu.org into a social networking site for anglers, for all anglers. It'll be chock full of information about conservation, about fishing, as well as the information that you're used to seeing on tu.org. We think it'll be yet another way to introduce people to the organization who might not already know us through our great local chapter meetings. And then finally, just a couple of other things I'd be remiss not to mention. Jed Feeblecorn just finished his first year as our new, TU, as our new On the Rise host and did a great job. Many of you have had an opportunity to fish with him, I'm sure. And Trout Magazine continues to garner awards for excellence in, in both its design and in the quality of the publication. You know, I, I think I will um, end this forced march right now um, and with a very, very brief conclusion. This is such an extraordinarily motivating presentation to make for me because it encapsulates in an hour I realize it's been an hour, um, the extraordinary work of TU. And you know, it should make you feel really good because you are TU. This is your organization. And the fact that we've been able to accomplish as much as we have is a testament to all of our commitment. And uh, the other, I mean, truly differentiating factor that sets us apart from almost every other environmental group in the country is that most environmental groups are essentially decrying loss whether it's uh, endangered species, water quality loss, loss of wild places. At TU, where others are decrying loss, we see opportunity for recovery. And that's the work of this organization. And I'll tell you folks, the best is yet to come for TU. Thank you for being here.